Well, hello there. Watching the press preview live this evening from Westminster. A first look, of course, at what is on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines. Hopefully not that, with the Evening Standard columnist Aisha Hazarika and The Sun's political editor Tom Newton Dunn. Welcome to both of you. Thank hello. you very much. Interesting day, of course. Uh, what is dominating? It's the budget. All of them pretty much budget-themed. The Telegraph, to start with, reports on what's arguably been the most headline-grabbing policy, the abolition of stamp duty on the first £300,000 of first-time homebuyers' purchases. The eye calls it Hammond's hard hat budget, highlighting that many of the measures have faced criticism today. Perhaps not surprisingly, The Guardian is among the sceptics with its headline, Hammond struggles to lift the gloom. The Mirror's assessment is even more blunt. They say, thanks for nothing. The Metro opts for a pun, now fill in the gaps amid suggestions the Chancellor's sums don't add up. Indeed, the Financial Times says the pragmatic housing policies were overshadowed by a grim outlook for the overall economy. The Express focuses on the £3 billion pot of money which it says has been set aside to ensure a speedy Brexit. The Times suggests it was a budget that finally began to make the turn away from austerity. And the Daily Mail takes back its Eeyore nickname for the Chancellor, but warns he should still be worried about debt. Picture of him laughing there. Aisha Hazarika, Tom Newton Dunn are here. Uh, let's go straight to the time, shall we? Hammond eases off austerity. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that is. Uh, that's exactly what actually happened today. It, it, I thought it was a fascinating budget. Technically, and the headlines are dominated by stamp duty, it was actually fine, quite an interesting thing to do, give young people a, a step up on the housing ladder by giving them a pretty decent tax break, by taking away stamp duty entirely uh, for their first purchases. Really, it's a minuscule thing. It doesn't cost very much money, uh, and it quite frankly probably rubbed out by the extra supply ads, but we'll come back to that. The really big story here is that the Chancellor Exchequer, who prided himself on being fiscal filled, the man who had his vice-like grip on the, on the, the state's coffers, uh, made a name across his entire cabinet career of tightening budgets in the MOD, in the Foreign Office, Mr. Cuts, has suddenly changed from fiscal fill to spend it like Corbyn, has blown £25 billion. So that's money we are now spending, we're never going to get back. He's not raising it in taxes, it's all going on the never never entirely to fill basically a whole lot of big uh, holes that the government had. Government problems and the solution to it. Be universal credit, he's now trying to sort of fix the problems with that in terms of bringing it forward, stopping people waiting that long. Whole load of money to the NHS to stave off a, almost certain another inevitable winter crisis. Uh, business rates coming in to hit people hard, businesses hard next April with a 3.9% rise. So he's spending away all the problems. And what's absolutely fascinating is governments normally spend like crazy just before a general election. They do that to make everyone feel good. They don't do it just after a general election like the one we just had. Normally, budgets just after general elections are, are, are really cruel things to raise taxes and do all sorts of horrible things that people have forgotten about the next time they come to vote in, in five years' time. This government has no majority. It's quite frankly fighting for its survival. Hammond is fighting to stay in number 11. Theresa May fighting to stay in number 10. And they are spending to keep themselves in power. So minority governments perhaps are generous governments, are they? Is he spending his way to keep himself out of trouble? Is that how you would say well, it? Well, I wouldn't see it like that at all. And I think if we look at the front page of, of the FT, I mm -hmm. think the big story that really dominates this budget and actually casts a stain over this budget are these terrible growth forecasts. The OBR have revised down the growth forecasts on productivity, on growth key indicators about the health of the future economy. And don't forget, lots of businesses, lots of economists are very anxious about the British economy, particularly with Brexit coming down the track. So I think, you know, interestingly, this is, his, this is the government's first post-election budget. This should be a budget where they actually set out quite a strong narrative, a political vision, a sense of direction about who they're for. And actually, what this budget seemed to do was, as Tom rightly said, was the Chancellor sort of fighting for his own political survival. The, what knives... about the tech stuff, though, the idea that that's where we need yeah. to park our tent Look, if we're going to survive Brexit. Every single political party will agree that we need lots of investment in skills, infrastructure. These are all good things. But there are lots of stuff that are still missing from this um, from this um, budget. And if we move on to the mirror, uh, they actually sum it up. I think I think a lot of people will feel this. It says thanks for nothing. 
and there's lots of things that weren't in this budget. Remember, the public sector have had an absolute hammering on their living standards. No pay increases for them. We've got the economy flatlining for five years. And the big sort of rabbit out the hat with um, stamp duty, which I'm sure we'll talk about more, a lot of people are saying that that's actually going to have the unintended consequence of driving up prices and not really dealing with the structural housing problems. OK, well, uh, the Telegraph goes on the, the help for first-time buyers, doesn't it? I mean, many people are saying it's further up the chain you need to help, perhaps, and you'll get a bubble of yes. help around that level. But nonetheless, what did you make of that uh, uh, removing stamp duty? I really that wasn't level? that impressed, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So what we all know is that we need to build more houses in this country desperately. We're building just above 200,000 now. We need to build 300,000 a year uh, just simply to keep up with the population growth from immigration, birth rates, etc. We're nowhere near that. We need dramatic action to do that. A lot of Tory MPs, uh, reforming MPs and uh, charities like Shelter, the housing charity, screaming for a, a, a massive, big whammy, big, bold action to, to do something and build more houses. We didn't get that from Philip Hammond today. He didn't borrow 50 billion to build, which is what the community secretary said Javid wanted. A little bit of planning reform, but they're not building on the green belt still, which a whole load of people wanted. Instead, we're getting these, are, these are small they not measures. Are building on the green? Because they said there's going to be planning reform to allow more houses to be built. Is that, is but, that put but, on the never-never? Never, quite categorically so. not on the green belt. So there was interesting, I mean, there's some interesting things like building on brownfield and sorting out brownfield sites. The government's going to spend about a billion quid to build on old brownfield sites if they're full of chemicals or other messes. The government will go in, remove all that, then sell it onto the, the land council tax on empty properties was another one. That, that, that's another interesting thing. But there wasn't a, a great, big, massive government building programme itself. Instead, there's these sort of slightly smaller measures. And one, of course, is a, a, a giveaway to try and somehow get some young people back to voting Tory uh, by giving them a, a pretty hefty stamp duty cut. Now, the problem so, with so it... So housing and rail fares, I suppose. Housing rail fares as well. The only problem with stamp duty, of course, yeah. is that stamp duty threshold only kicks in at £120,000. You don't have to pay anything until you get to £120,000. So it doesn't pounds. help the poorest, is what you're saying. The, a huge swathes of the country, you know, Wales, Scotland, Yorkshire, the North East, the average house price is below where the stamp duty threshold already so starts. So no help. it's not going to help. It's going to help people down here yeah. in London, around here. Not so great I mean, north. I would absolutely agree with Tom. Sir. And I think what the Conservatives don't understand is there's a big structural issue with housing. And remember in Theresa May's conference speech, they announced a little bit on help to buy. All that does is actually stimulate demand for housing. If they really wanted to seize the political agenda, something big and bold and radical on housing really would have um, you know, done them good. But unfortunately, they, they've missed an opportunity with that. So would you agree with the Daily Mirror's assessment, the no-hope budget, stamp duty tax cut exposed as a gimmick, the economy is to flatline for at least five years, no pay rises for long-suffering public sector. Is it as gloomy as that? Was there nothing there really for, for the jams of, uh, of tomorrow? I don't think there is very much because I think this country is going to go into a period of quite choppy economic uncertainty. But surprised by that? So, I don't think anyone is surprised by that. The thing, but... the thing is, is the Chancellor has just spent £25 billion of taxes money now he's spent on the NHS, on universal you credit, on business rates. You think the Labour backbenchers might be pleased with that, but... Uh, well, well, You're well, never going to get Labour backbenchers, well, and probably you might even struggle to get Aisha to say it's a good thing. Well, I, I, I disagree well, with it, because I think it's spending too much money on the wrong things. Oh, well, on the, your choices, the big solutions not, please, like your choices are political. So if we turn to, if we turn to the mail, yeah. there's a question about nurses' pay. Now, he has kind of opened up the possibility of nurses' pay going up, but... We don't know how much by it. And do not forget, so many public sector workers around the country who actually traditionally had voted Conservative in the past moved away from the Conservative Party because they have really been feeling the squeeze. And now what the Daily Mail is saying, well, actually, maybe, you know, this will be a dangerous thing because it will open it up to public sector workers. That is exactly what he should be doing. And a lot of the trade unions and, and public sector workers are saying, you know what, this budget has not done anything for us and we are the just about managing. So was he suggesting that this money would not be met out of NHS budgets? Is that the... Yeah, this is the interesting the, the, thing. So, the coy look to Jeremy Hunt we saw in the So paper. here's the thing. Two or three months ago, the government said, was well, slightly forced into saying by uh, various people reporting it, that they're going to abandon this 1% cap on pay rises across the public sector. It's been this terrible freeze now for six years. No one's got a pay rise of any real note in the, in, in the public sector apart from progression pay. But, you know, and, and their pay is flatline. That's been really hard. Eventually, basically by a cabinet revolt, the health secretary, the defence secretary, all saying, we've got to pay our people more, they're going to start leaving us. It was forced on the Chancellor, but he then said to them, right, well, you can have your pay rise, I'll get rid of your 1% cap, but you can have to meet it yourself from inside your own budgets. Today, he's, he's given some slack on that, and he's told Jeremy Hunt, I will pay for some uh, nurses' increases, but, but nobody else. I, I don't think this is sustainable, because the problem is then yeah, soldiers not, are going to... Well, the soldiers are going to say, is, well, hang on a minute, This is acute, though, isn't it, that many come from the European Union... You know, that, that 
immigration will be cut off. But it's also a bigger question across the public sector. You know, Theresa May's words on the steps of Downing Street, the just about managing, not only have they, you know, had a pay freeze, actually inflation has been going up as well. Now, you know, we're a country which right now is saying that we've got to get our public services to work better. You know, when Grenfell happened, we were all praising the firefighters to the rafters. Yet what they want is just a basic, decent pay rise. And I think he's missed a big political trick. He could have sent a big signal. And this, remember, this is the first budget since the election. A lot of those people deserted the Conservatives for the Labour Party because of that cap. But the growth forecast means less money is coming into the Treasury. The squeeze happens again over there at number 11 Downing Street. It makes it even harder for them. The constraints there have, are there. There you have your problem. So what he did was, this time last year, the autumn statement in 2016, he set aside £26 billion for a rainy day in case Brexit went wrong. And the, the Tory right were very upset with him because he was being far too pessimistic. But he had all this money to save for, for Brexit. This year, a year on, after a general election, now with no majority at all and, and the, his back against the wall and the people behind him wanting to stab him as well on the green benches, he's spent it all. And still, what happened today was the public sector, public finances deteriorated even more with this, this appalling collapse in growth from the productivity downgrade. So he's got an still even in positive territory. It could have been worse could, if you'd listened to the, the, well, that could be the, the new thing. Could have been fear. worse. This could, could have been worse. <laughs> but there is a school of thought, by the way, which if you put more money into the pockets of public sector workers, they will spend it, and it will actually help growth and be a bit but, of a. But it, where does it, the money come from then? That's the problem. Because I mean, everyone agrees with spending more money, paying people more, but. If you've I literally spent all you've got left, which you know, is just done today. It's about the choices. I think actually the public are behind what, paying public. When you public. say choices, what little would you spend? What would you not spend on to pay well, public? Well, I would sector? have actually. Well, I would have borrowed more. I would have borrowed more for housing, and Buy I would more. have borrowed. So we're already maxing out. He's already out. borrowing more, though, Tom. He's the one that's so ripped up. He is, many more billions on the never never. It doesn't really the, matter anymore, does it? He's the one that ripped up George Osborne's austerity targets. I, I in a way, agree because it almost doesn't matter anymore. The deficit will now not be eradicated. Philip Hammond says until 2025. Mm. That's seven years away. The OBR said so today, forget that, yeah. you're never going to get done until 2030. But don't we pay more in debt, interest payments, than we do for the entire budget for the police and the Completely. armed services? And the more so we, we borrow, the that? more we have to pay on interest. And you know, eventually there's going to be a reckoning for all this. The same with consumer credit in, in, in households. There is he no said such we thing are, we're more another. susceptible to shocks, I think he said today, didn't he? Um, just very quickly, because we will come back to the budget, the funny bits. Out of 10, what would you score him uh, and the budget today? Because he had his back up against the wall, I really didn't think he had much choice. Minority government, Tories are hating, they were going to kill anything bold he did anyway. I'd say five and a half to six. Oh, I would have said probably, yeah, I'd say probably at six. You're giving more Even than. More. How does that work? <laughs> anyway. I, think, I think his performance is better than I thought it was going to be. Okay. Style substance. You can, you can increase your figure. Let's hope he's not watching. Anyway, uh, still to come, we will have more on the budget, as I said, the jokes and uh, the rest of the day's news as well. Back in a moment. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me this evening, Aisha Hazarika and Tom Newton Dunn. Um, funny moments, one might say, but let's uh, continue with some of the more serious stuff. The Daily Mail front page, Eeyore. Explain to all those who might have missed that moment. Uh, so, Eeyore, we all know from Winnie the Pooh, the miserable old donkey. Jacob Rees-Mogg, a very uh, colourful Tory backbencher, got up in the House of Commons a few months ago uh, and said uh, very rudely about the Chancellor Exchequer, he's Eeyore, some dour-faced, miserable old so-and-so, but what we need is red rum. In other words, we need somebody who really cares about Brexit, is going to embrace it, which, as we know, Philip Hammond is an arch remainer and has no interest to. The Daily Mail, however, now that Philip Hammond has put aside £3 billion to spend on Brexit, preparations for a deal, preparations for no deal, was an awful lot of money, the Daily Mail think he's a rather nice chap, and the, the Express front page is quite similar to the Mail's. They also think this money on Brexit is a really rather good thing. However, I would be, be wary if I was uh, Philip Hammond, because the Daily Mail can turn on people very quickly, particularly if they feel that they're not being Brexity enough for their liking. He may get called an enemy of the people or a saboteur at any point. And certainly the Daily Mail has been pretty harsh, hasn't it, on Philip Hammond in the past. Yeah. So does that mean the, if that's a getaway with it kind of front page, is it, for well, number 11 well, Downing Street? It's, it's fascinating that the change... This, uh, Again, one of the subtexts of today, which is why it actually was quite an interesting budget. Philip Hammond was really fighting for his own survival. There's no doubt about that. I was told this morning by people number 10 he was extremely nervous overnight and this morning because he knew if, he, if he'd muck this one up, as he mucked up the last one in, in the spring, remember the, the Nick's budget was a total uh, implosion. And he's been gaffing quite a bit over the last few days as well. And that was really going to be him out. He'd lost all sport altogether. So he really had to pull off quite an impressive Commons performance, not just a budget that didn't implode within hours, but also an impressive performance. He needed to make jokes, he needed to smile, and he needed to be likeable. And he also 
desperately needed to show some humility. Well, if you look back at the front page, the, that front page of the, uh, the Daily Mail, picture of him smiling and looking relaxed. He targeted some of those gaffes you mentioned, like the 1.4 million people unemployed yeah. he recognises are real unemployed. And he made a lot of jokes, didn't he? Even, even the jokes made the front page of the Financial Times. And they're quite funny. As well. At least I, I thought they were well, so modern. How's the stand up comic? Well, look, you have to remember these set pieces in the House of Commons. Normally, the House of Commons is actually very, very dull, but it comes alive Prime Minister's questions, statements, and of course, the budget. And it turns from being quite an arid debating chamber into a stage. It becomes a theatre. And what the backbenchers want, what the troops want, what people like Tom in the press gallery want, is they want sharp lines, they want great oratory, and they want jokes. A budget speech is not complete without a few cracks at the Opposition, a few jokes, and I think to be fair, it's like the bar is low in the House of Commons. Well. You know, I know I used to write jokes to them, but I think what's interesting is I think his team will have spent a long time crafting those jokes. Some of them self-deprecating, like you know, mass. I know how to show the nation a good time, that type of thing. And I think they'll probably feel quite pleased with the effort that they put in. Although I do have to say to people, it is a low bar. Don't expect Phil Giggles Hammond to be like on a national comedy tour anytime soon. Yeah, I think the mass was uh, probably more successful than the cough sweets for me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the costume you know, this vaudeville act of the yeah, Prime well, Minister playing along. Like, oh, yeah, this was oh, the, the budget. Going. Let's uh, hold on to those. For, for um, what about the winners and the losers, the giveaways, the sun inside pages has some of this detail. Who, who, who benefited most from this? Well, we are giving him a, a reasonable win. I don't think we're giving him 10 out of 10, but we're giving him a, a reasonable win tonight because he, he did what we really would like him to do every single budget, which is he, he throws fuel duty again for the sixth year in a, in a, in a row now. It's cost the, the Exchequer something like £46 billion in wow. 2010. But these sorts of things really matter to, to people on not very much money who are perhaps a small businessman driving around in a van, working for themselves. They really cannot afford having to pay hundreds of pounds more a year on things like fuel duty. Massive cash cow for the Treasury. Gordon Brown loved it because it made him an absolute fortune. Mm -hmm. He spent nine a billion quid a year freezing fuel duties. That's pretty good. Big giveaways again. The NHS gets 2.8 billion. The NHS saying that's not going to be enough for them. And of course, you know, a rail card now, uh, uh, cheap rail uh, travel for younger people up to the age of, of 31. So there's a little bit of there for everybody. But this is, again, this is, you know, piecemeal giveaway sweetie budgets that you get before general elections, it's, not it's after. It's tiny. And in terms of the offer for the young people, this idea of a rail card, that's like a band-aid over an axe wound. That is not going to cut the mustard when, you know, young people have got, you know, horrific tuition fees and they've got no chance. Right. They've got to live with their parents until they're like 93 now, basically. But in terms of who lost out, for me, Tom mentioned the health service. I think, again, a big political choice that he, he missed was social care. Adult social care yeah. continues to be a huge issue. This you is know. a minority government. You can't get anything. No, but you know what? Actually, Anna, I think he would have had support for that because every single party is keen to do something on, on social care. Maybe so, we need a cross-party commission. Well, that's now. what they're doing. So this, that takes <laughs> months. True, I think well, they do. Takes, and they're doing that. And they've said yeah. they're going to spend months doing this. Uh, and we'll next hear about it next summer. Uh, eventually, they'll try and get a cross-party agreement. The other great thing that didn't happen at all today was intergenerational fairness. We had a bit of a stamp duty cut for first-time buyers, but it really only works if you live in the South. But, you know, this, all the wealth in the country at the moment yeah. is with older people who live in nice big houses, and very little is with the millennials and, and younger people. One big way to do that is to tackle pension tax relief. He didn't even go anywhere near that. And okay. it's potentially careless or potentially yeah. real politics because he ain't got the numbers but over finally, there. finally, the person that did the best out of this budget was Phil Hammond. On that note, we will end. Thank you very much indeed. Aisha Hazarika, Tom Newton-Dunn, thank you. Thank you.